Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Bonnie Lin, a PhD candidate in practical theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Jonathan Tran today. Jonathan is Associate Professor of Religion at Baylor University, where he holds the George W. Baines Chair of Religion. His forthcoming book on Asian Americans and the Spirit of Racial Capitalism will be published this fall by Oxford University Press. In the book, Jonathan proposes a new approach to American anti-racism, drawing from extended case studies of the Mississippi Delta Chinese and of a multi-ethnic congregation in San Francisco. Jonathan's presentation today is titled, Ethnography at the Ruins of Asian America. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Bonnie, and thanks uh, for you all to have me again. Uh, I'm gonna do um, three things here. I wanna uh, describe what I mean by the ruins of Asian America. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about what ethnography means in that space. And then I really wanna open up to a broader discussion about how we as a, as a community that's really been gathered here uh, might begin to organize ourselves going forward in light of some of these conversations. I think the three other panelists today offered remarkably stirring observations and comments, and it followed in line with our friends and colleagues from yesterday. So I just I thought it would be appropriate to take this moment and kind of look more broadly. So, so let me just say a couple of things about what I mean by this term, the ruins of um, Asian America, and then what it means to do ethnography, which is really to say what it means to honor this space. So um, as Dr. Jane Hong said yesterday, Asian America as a term began as a political project, namely as a third world internationalism that always understood race as intertwined with quick questions of class, gender, uh, imperialism, poverty. Uh, and so race was always opened up to a larger purview of questions. This directly fell in line with the thinkers of the black radical tradition from Du Bois forward who always understood whatever race was, it was part of an ideological structure meant to justify domination and exploitation, uh, which I talked about yesterday. Uh, notice in the stories that have already been told by the various panelists over the last two days, this story is deeply international and transnational in scope. So the story of say, South Indians, uh, South Asians or East Asians coming as labor in the 18th, 19th century, um, is an international story. The story I told about the three wars uh, the US fought against Japan, Korea, and then Vietnam is obviously a transnational, transpacific story. This is part of what I mean by the problem of contemporary anti-racism in America is that it tells this story often as an overly narrow American story. Um, and that's why it's the case that Asian Americans often don't fit in that story because by nature to include us in the stories to confound the very story upon which the politics is built. Uh, this makes for an uncomfortable relationship that largely has resulted in us being marginalized as I and uh, others have uh, spoken about this weekend. So one, one, one question we wanna ask is how then did we start as an international um, political project? What the folks, our good friends over at Princeton University and P uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, what, what they talk about when they mean racial identity as a pragmatic project, something that's plastic and mobile and something that we're constantly negotiating. How did it go from that with the primary goal of liberation? How did it go from that to really being a kind of privatized individual and often essential identity. Well, the story we need to tell then or follow is what happens after Asian in America begins the political project largely at San Francisco State University and Cal amidst the protest movements with these other kinds of international commitments. Uh, what happens afterwards, of course, is the rise of what we call neoliberal um, global capitalism, which is really just a fancy way of saying after the extraordinary political protest movements that happened in the United States, but in other places in the world, and after the ending of lots of colonization, after the ending of decades of war, uh, people began to say they wanted a different future, but that different future required the dismantling of structures and systems of domination. Uh, the political movements in the 60s and early 70s was this, the people saying, uh, enough, we're tired of you not only dominating us, but um, dividing and conquering us. 
there was a massive response on the part of the new government, which we really began to see in the late 70s and 1980s. This was the emergence of a global political capitalist power that basically made a decision with the market to make sure that this never happened again. And over the course of several decades between Thatcherism and Reaganism, and how almost all the left kowtowed to this, we began to see a new political order. Um, the squashing of local political grounded movements, uh, the destruction of labor, uh, the splintering of questions of intersectionality, gender, race, identity, uh, and other questions. Uh, and then we saw really what became a kind of global capitalist order. Uh, and that's the world we live in now. Part of what happened out of this was an absolute splintering of the left. On the one hand, you had those who remained committed to questions of class, gender, respective identities. But on the other hand, the identities became constituent essential realities in and of themselves, as if identity became a kind of self-interpreting, self-realizing project. Uh, this uh, coordinated or matched onto a, a kind of ascending therapeutic culture all of a sudden, identity became deeply separated from the political projects that they originally uh, started with. And so what you had was the rise of an identity politics that with no clear connection into the liber liberative realities out of which, you know, identities like Asian American began in the first place. Uh, that largely describes where we're at, we're at now, where each of us individually um, are kind of burdened with the project of kind of asserting, securing, uh, and protecting our own identities. Um, and then we uh, it kind of introduce ourselves and our identities in competition with other identities. What you'll notice about this history is it's remarkably similar to the creation of race at the beginning of the United States, which was the creation of constituent racial identities as a divide and conquer strategy so that elites could dominate. Um, and that's largely the story we're in now. I think we are at an inflection point at least um, with recent movements, say over the last decade, where things can begin to shift. I think this is a genuine moment of opportunity if we can step into it. Uh, so the question then is how do you do ethnography in this? So let me transition then to the second part of um, these brief remarks. If Asian American identity is a kind of splintered set of negotiations in the context of the ruination of a political project, to an increasingly privatized one. Ethnography of Asian Americans is the attempt to step into the space and learn how people are negotiating their lives as individuals, as communities, um, as part of larger networks. How do they make sense of their lives of, as Asian Americans? Uh, David earlier in his opening comments already referenced to a comment by Jay Caspian Kang, the New York Times Magazine commentator. Um, who talked about Asian American identity at this point being in some significant sense uh, groundless and meaningless. And I think what Kang means by that is absent its connection to these larger networks, it's unclear what we mean by it. In my ethno ethnographic project then, I want to see how we do this. Um, I want to see how we negotiate this space. Um, how do Asian Americans claim Asian American identity when it's often really unclear what that can mean? I mean, um, it's not directly attached to any language or nation or say even culinary or food experience. So what does it mean to be or claim, have someone claim for you that you're Asian American? So kind of six quick observations around ethnography. Um, in, in approaching this work, I knew I would have to do the hard work of analysis. That is, I would need to look at the larger systems and structures out of which these came. So both in the um, uh, the Deep South economy after Reconstruction, as well as the post-war economy in San Francisco. These are the kinds of hard work we need to do if we're going to make sense of kind of practical realities. I'd grown increasingly suspicious of uh, the academic elite's theorization. So if I earlier narrated the kind of a, an ascension of a therapeutic culture after the splintering of the left, you also saw among elite academics, especially in the managerial classes, you increasingly saw something like the cultural turn that had no direct connection to material realities on the ground. So the first thing I knew I needed to do was just study the material realities on the ground. How were geography systems set up? In San Francisco, I want to know how travel routes worked. Uh, in Mississippi, I wanted to know how, what was it like to create a store, a business? Um, how were neighbors constituted? These on-the-ground realities 
would be critical to beginning to understand how Asian Americans negotiate space. Um, the second thing is I committed to an ethnographic theory or method um, um, coined by Matthew Desmond of Princeton University. Many of you may know him. He wrote a book called Evicted. He's also um, pioneered theories of ethnography. For, for Desmond, ethnography maps two kinds of things, human beings and their relationships and networks, but also the larger structures in which they kind of uh, try to live their lives every day. For me, I was really interested in how racial capitalism works. What does it mean to be Asian American when being Asian American is defined by contemporary and older forms of racial capitalism? So in the book, there's actually a number of diagrams where I try to map some of this out. What Desmond is really interested in and uh, me therefore was trying to see what are the, not only individuals, but what are the systems in which we live? Um, Thirdly, another observation I made do, while doing a lot of the oral history and ethnographic work was a lot of the skills I learned from ethnographers and theories of ethnography, uh, oral histories, but I also learned that a lot of the basic skills of ethnography I learned from ministry. Ministry is about listening, trying to figure out storylines that people are living in, trying to identify the fault lines in those storylines, uh, and then just coming alongside with basic practices of listening listening and listening um, and continue to see kind of how people negotiate life. Fourth, there is a philosophical commitment. My primary work is not in Asian American studies or even race. My primary area of studies in philosophical theology and specifically philosophy of language. Um, what I noticed with ethnography, a question I had consistently in telling the story of Asian Americans is when do I get explicitly theological? I proceeded with a basic uh, philosophical co commitment that any empirical fact, any fact about the world, insofar as it's a fact, pressed far enough and given enough time will admit of theological facts. So, so let me say that again, I operated under the condition, I mean, the, the confidence that all empirical facts, insofar as they are facts, tell stories about God. That gave me the confidence to not always have to lead with the theology, but to let the theology be implicit and only at times necessarily explicit. Five, I wanted to just tell stories with lots of disjunctions, ruptures, and continuities. Why? Because we're creatures with lots of disjunctions, ruptures, and continuities. I wanted to trouble dominant narratives. I wanted to be surprised, not simply surprise the reader, but in the research, be surprised myself. Uh, for example, I found that the model minority myth, we think, we Asian Americans think originated with us, uh, the imposing of a category onto us really was the beginning in America. The first people in where the model minority myth was imposed upon was African-Americans. They were wedged against my, um, Chinese migration and inclusion. They were spoken of as the model minority as a way to keep out Chinese. Uh, this was a really surprising revelation to me, but I also found it liberating that this trope has been imposed on many people. It's not something just unique to Asian-Americans. It's something we suffer with our um, African-American brothers and sisters as well. Um, I wanted to be um, surprised at, by the disjunctions of amazing characters. Um, in the first part of the book where I talk about the Mississippi Chinese, I certainly have some very critical things to say about uh, Chinese business practices that exploited poor black communities. Um, on the one hand, they served them and gave them um, opportunities in food deserts because of Jim Crow and segregation. But the other, on the other hand, uh, these Chinese Americans, many of whom were Christian, got rich off of doing this. And oftentimes, the Christianity just had nothing to say about these modes of exploitation. On the other hand, while telling the story, I really needed to be amazingly committed to being empathetic to who they were. All in these ways, by kind of working hard in that direction, I found really, really powerful stories, particularly the story of two brothers, one who became um, incredibly uh, successful as an electrical engineering, uh, an electrical engineer and inventor. The other one who stayed behind and ran a store for 40 years. He did in fact um, operate in practices of exploitation, but I caught him in his latter years where he reflected back on that. And I asked him, did you ever feel bad? He said, I felt bad all the way through and I still feel bad. Uh, telling the story of these brothers and particularly this latter brother, uh, was one of the great honors of this uh, job. Um, not because I'm here to kind of show where people have come up short,
but to tell the story of all of us. We all come up short. And in these moments of reckoning, there's also possibilities of progress and hope. Um, uh, a sixth thing, observation I, I made, which was um, I knew in telling the story, uh, telling a story about race, that it would be harder for people to be interested in goodness than where we fail. Um, and this has to do with our cultural moment. Uh, we're more inclined to critique as a posture, more, more inclined to be critical, or more suspicious. Uh, we look for um, reasons to doubt and to question. A lot of this is good and necessary because of the forms of domination on our life. But a question I asked throughout is how do we do that? Well, as I said about said yesterday, while also being mindful of goodness. And so there's a lot of goodness in the story I try to tell. And I realize in our culture, writing about goodness is surprisingly more difficult than writing about what where we fail. Uh, and some of this I blame kind of evangelical testimonials. I think we all know that. What you know, when some kid gets up in front of a church and tells the testimony of all the bad stuff, you know, he or she did, you know, we're really interested in all the bad stuff. And then when when uh, she finally gets saved in the story, we, we're like, oh, go back to the bad stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, how do we tell the story of goodness that captures uh, evil, uh, but does not let evil run the show? And that was something significant for me, especially in a moment where anti-racists are just exhausted by. Uh, resistance running the show rather than proclamation. The last thing I wanted to do was say something about um, uh, the complexities of Asian American life, um, that we are both, um, right, that we're both perpetrators uh, as well as emancipators. One of the things that was um, pretty painful to read about was not simply the way the model minority myth wedges us against others, but really the way the, the model minority myth, right, at its most pernicious, isn't that it kind of, it, the most pernicious thing isn't the kind of burdens we feel in fulfilling it. Probably the most pernicious thing is the injustices we perpetuate in completing it, in becoming minorities. And here I saw lots of things like resource hoarding um, at the educational level, and I wanted to think beyond that. Uh, so let me just, I know I'm, I only got a couple of minutes, but let me just say something about going forward. Um, if we're at the ruins of a certain phase in history, uh, season of Asian America, when we move from a political project to a deeply independent and private one, if we want to move to a more public political one driven to liberation, uh, where identity is the sub, right, lived experience is the substance of identity, uh, but liberation is its vocation and direction, then I think our next steps going forward from this conference is that we want to begin to organize ourselves. Um, when I started writing this book, a lot of my friends said, you're going to find a lot of enemies in writing a book like this. Uh, but others said, you're also going to find people who have been thinking this stuff for a long time, wanting to jump into anti-racism or already participating in anti-racist moments and movements, but feel disenfranchised, marginalized, not heard, not seen. Write a book um, that can where you can find one another. And that's really what I set out to do. Um, I realized there are other people involved in this project for years, long before me. Um, I met a number of people at this conference, um, something, so, someone like a Tree Vo, who's organizing digitally in Minneapolis, or someone like a DJ Chuang, who's been digitally organizing us for decades, long before that was Vogue. Um, so I think our next step is to begin to organize. I think John Huang and David Chow has already created some of the critical infrastructure for us to take next steps. Um, and I think we can build off that. And then you think about people like Melissa Borja, who who's just who has an extraordinary gift set, a uh, skill set uh, that really can be the public face and leading us forward, kind of as a community. Uh, and then the many, many others of you out there uh, in this kind of room right now. I would think that we need four kinds of folks, um, or we need at least four kinds of folks. We certainly need academics who are going to do super hard work, uh, and. Uh, are going to work at the highest levels of theory and publishing. Um, uh, last year, the Southern Baptist Church, which is associated um, uh, with uh, Baylor University, said, uh, we're, we reject out of hand uh, critical race theory. And when I read that, I thought, for academics to say this, because they're all academics saying this, you either A, don't know what critical race theory is, or B, you don't really care about anti-racism. Because if you're committed to anti-racism, you'll, you'll look for every tool in the toolbox. 
um, we need the critical work of doing the hard work of seeing what tools are available. The second group of people we need is organizers, those who are relationally committed on the ground. They're the bread and butter of not only our movement, but any movement. And here I, I mean the broad range of organization, those who get in the streets and get people to get in the streets and protest, as long as those who work in neighborhood schools tutoring kids, right? So uh, those who are relationally committed on the ground. Third, we need congregations. Congregations are the backbone of what we do. Um, it's often, the I mean, we all live in churches and we know the reality of them. But the congregation is the local place where we live ordinary lives with other people and cultivate relationships um, of normal lived experience. Um, my critique follows a lot of Marxist ideological critique of race, but here's one place I understand Christianity significantly differing from Marxism. Marxists are waiting for a revolution to start. Christians are living into a revolution 2,000 years old. By living into that, we don't rely on ourselves. And the fourth group of people that we need to begin with are those who are not sure, right? They're asking questions. They're not true believers one way or the other. They feel something, something's off, but they want something more. We need to create extraordinarily hospitable spaces for these folks to ask questions. I, my guess is that it's gonna be their questions rather than our certain and overconfident convictions that will drive the conversation forward. Uh, so those are just kind of some um, humble suggestions about how we might move forward, some claims about ethnography and some uh, statements about ruin. Uh, I welcome your questions, uh, either about these brief comments or about um, anything I said yesterday. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Jonathan Tran. This was just so thought provoking. Um, yes, we now have 10 minutes of Q&A, so please feel free to continue typing and upvoting questions in the Q under the Q&A tab. So I'll begin with a question from Easton Law, and he asks, just because I'm at the cusp of exploring different, a different dimension of the <laughs> ethnographic imagination, I'm curious to hear your perspective on autoethnography in your projects and the ways it might implicate your own presence. Uh, yeah, you know, I forgot, Bonnie. Um, I have to say something about the little floating emojis um, because several people made an observation yesterday. I kind of went into preacher mode and I really wasn't <laughs> anticipating that. I just have to say the little floating emojis, like the floating thumbs and blue hearts was just like <laughs> intoxicating. I mean, I felt like it was like Asian American digital nerds channeling <laughs> their inner black church. Um, like they, they can't do it in a congregation, but on a kind of anonymous thing, it's like, Thumbs up, blue hearts. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I just, it just like I was like riding the wave of the spirit of this community. I'm yes. such a I'm such a tech adoptee and so backward on my digital thing. When other people were speaking, I kept on wanting to push the button with the emojis, but I kept on pushing the raise hand button um, <laughs> instead. And I'm sure people were like. The, the organizers are like, does this moron want to, um, you know, ask a question or does he not? <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, uh, I just, I just love the, the, uh, the, the emojis. But I also long to be physically um, present with you all in some context. Um, David Chow has done an extraordinary job. John Huang uh, has done a yo man's work a lot to put us together. I would love for us to be together in some, in some way, and we will have to wait to see uh, how that is possible. Um, auto, auto, um, ethnography. Yeah. I realize, um, Easton that in telling the story of these people, when I say something like, you know, so-and-so in this story is clearly trying to figure out, um, what it means for, you know, her to be Asian American. I realized I was telling my own story. Um, but also I was realizing the fissures between us, right? One of the things that, I, um, ethnic racial, racial eth identity often tempts us to do is to believe that we are too closely aligned to people who are not. The women who were shot in Atlanta were murdered in Atlanta. On the one hand, there is some place of solidarity for me to say, yeah, I am like them. But I also need to be careful. I'm not like them. I'm privileged. I have a high paying job. I live in a suburb. I'm a man, um, right? These are critical differences. Um, so. I think the work of autoethnography is to align the similarities, but also bring out the important differences. This is critical to any movement, to align where we match up, um, but also where we critically differ. And that's why I think this fourth 
population in our movement going forward of hospitality uh, is critical. Um, we need to be we need to cultivate the question and be driven and inspired by questions. So. Yeah, thank you. Self-reflexivity is so important in ethnographic work. So Gilbert asks, Dr. Tran, I love the connection you make between your ministry experience and your research endeavors. Can you comment on the connection between your theological anthropology and your ethnographic work? Yeah, thank you for that question. I, I mean, in brief, I think the, the benefit to ethnographies illumines what it means for us to be creatures. Um, Right, it, it makes clear kind of what it means to live life. And that's why ethnographic grounded case study work um, has been super important. I mostly operate the level of kind of theory, really abstract philosophical theory. What I found in writing about people's lives is I had to, I, would, I was now accountable, right? It's, it's very different than writing about, you know, Wittgenstein who's been dead for like a hundred years. He's a, he's a great uh, language philosopher. Very different than to write something so, where you know the person you're writing about is going to read it. Um, uh, this opens up critical junctures for what it means to be human and human together in this project. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we have time for one more question. So from Tian An Wang uh, asks, given your understanding of Asian Americans and racial capitalism, can you comment on the role of Asians in class struggle given the vast economic inequality amongst Asians in the U.S.? Oh, this is <laughs> this, this is a good question, a, a <laughs> difficult question, um, because if racial cap, if race has to do with class, and in my view, they are inexhaustibly intertwined, right? So some people say, well, you should go race essentialism, class essentialism, race and class name synonymous realities. They are separate realities, but they are they they're always kind of blended into each other. What do we do? I think the question is <laughs> it's a question of what do we do with rich Christians? Um, and can rich Christians, I mean, I'm sorry, rich Asian American Christians, can they be a part of the story? Well, we know that Jesus troubles wealth. <laughs> um, and, and we know that uh, race is wound up in class domination. So part of the beauty of what we're talking about, and this is why I think it's critical that we, we locate this in relationship to congregations, is that Christianity already has a discourse of dispossession. We don't have to invent that in the work of revolution. One of the things I've often found missing in anti-racist activism is it makes no claims about personal accountability. And, 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 and rightly it should and shouldn't because it's worried about systems of oppression. But Christianity does have claims about how I ought to live, what I ought to buy, you know, what kinds of friends, who I ought to um, relate to. Um, and so this kind of claim opens up a really difficult conversation. Uh, it's too often times the case that right we want to align our anti-racist politics um, to corporate goods like you know Google signing on as a virtue signaling statement um, for Black Lives Matter, all the while perpetuating systems that conspire against Black life. Well, there's a personal Asian American version of that too, not only in terms of relationships, say, to our Black and Brown brothers and sisters, but in relationship to other Asian Americans. Uh, and it's going to be this kind of serious accountability. And what that will look like, I have no idea because I recognize the, the, the destruction the destruction of oppression. But we need to have that conversation. That's why I I, I dared to, dared to write about things like um, Asian American opportunity hoard resource hoarding and ed in education cities. Right, that's a hard thing to say, but that's a conversation we need to have. That's something I and others need to be held accountable to. Thank you so much. So. Now please join Dr. Tran and our morning speakers in a panel session that's starting momentarily. So thank you.